for the next lecture, f I will start from the long story. Me personally, I sometimes I love to enter the Wikipedia and read it about cognitive biases to remember that our mind is freaking bad and understanding the reality beside things. So, and marketing specialists, they all know how to work with our imperfect mind to make us pay and pay more and didn't notice that. And so Stefan probably will tell us about practical ways to do that, right? Uh, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so my talk today is about monetization strategies, essentially, and how to leverage human buying behavior. So it's essentially drawing on a lot of uh, things that retailers have learned over the centuries and how that can be applied to free-to-play games. All right, um, I've also been warned uh, by an early reviewer of the presentation that some of its content may be considered unethical, so if you're concerned about your free-to-play karma, I suggest you leave now or you shut your eyes for the next 20 minutes. And I already man managed to break it. There, there you go. All right. So um, a little bit about us. I'm going to uh, do this really quickly. So Area Games is a company that publishes free-to-play games. That's all we do. We've never touched a game that was not free-to-play. Uh, we generally license our games in Asia and then bring them to the West. Um, probably done that for over 70 titles, uh, both on PC, which is where we started in 2007, and lately a lot on mobile, which is probably more relevant for the audience here. Um, we operate in about 150 countries, uh, 13 languages, I'm going to spare you all the details, but uh, one of the things that we have uh, concentrated on in the past in, in all the history of our company was monetization because we couldn't touch most of the content of the games that we licensed on the PC era. Uh, so the only thing that we could influence were prices and how to communicate offers to people. So essentially that's why we focus so much on monetization. You'll see some of our uh, tricks of the trade today. Um, to make it more relevant for you and, and uh, give you a reason to listen to me today, uh, we actually managed to translate some of this into successful uh, grossing ranks in Germany and France. As you can see, Immortalis, a uh, card trading app uh, that, that we run, uh, actually peaked in, in top two and top three grossing in, in Germany and France. And Goal One, which is another app that we run, uh, was top 10 in Germany. So um, I hope that makes it a little bit more straightforward. All right, so what is behavioral pricing? Before I get started with the actual content, uh, let me tell you how pricing typically, typically works when you go into the real world. Let's say I wanted to price this laptop. So I would look at the production cost. Let's say producing this laptop costs $500. And then I would think about, mm, what, what kind of a markup do I need to make in order to have a good margin when selling this laptop? So I would slap on another 100% and then sell it for $1,000. Bam, I have a price. That's easy. Now, for virtual items, that doesn't really work because virtual items are free. I can create as many as I want. I can have 100 million database entries for a particular sword that I can sell in my game. So I don't really have a production price that I can start with. So pricing for virtual items needs to work differently. So um, pricing for virtual items, at least that's our theory, is entirely based on the perception of value. If I'm trying to sell you a virtual sword, I could sell it to you for $1 or for $20 or for $100 or for $100,000. And I would not have a good way of actually fixing that price. It all depends on how much you think it's worth. So this price perception is actually more important than the value of an item because Essentially, the value lies in the eye of the beholder. So you need to figure out what your customer thinks this item is worth, and you can influence that in a number of ways. Uh, for instance, you can set signals with a price level, so you can set an item at $1.99 instead of $2, because that's kind of what people expect and, and what they're used to in their everyday behavior when they enter a supermarket. Or you can communicate it in, in various ways with discounts and, and all sorts of special offers. We'll show some examples in a bit. And uh, you can also change the perception of value by putting that price for a particular item uh, inside the context of several other offers that you have where you have different prices for different items and that changes how people perceive the value of that item. And I'm gonna show you some examples in a bit. All right, so let's get into the specifics. Here, I, I apologize, the examples are German, but I think you'll figure it out anyway. Those are some examples of flyers that retail companies in Germany will just put into newspapers or put in your mailbox to spam you, essentially, the good old way. Um, as you can tell, the key thing that they're trying to communicate here is that they have low prices. The $2.99, the 
the German there täglich tief says daily low prices, right? So essentially they're trying to make you perceive that store as being everyday low price. But if they were everyday low price on every single item, then they wouldn't be making any money. So essentially when you go there, they want you to think that every item in the store is low price because you've been exposed to these flyers for a long time. But not every item in the store is actually low price. Maybe the two items that they communicate about, the cell phone and the, and the laptop there, are, are competitively priced, but all the rest of the store can't be. So essentially, they anchor your perception of the price level in that store before you even go to the store. And then when you're there, you'll probably end up buying something else um, at a regular price without checking. Here's another example. Let's say you wanted to buy a suitcase. So I want to buy a suitcase. And then the sales rep says, great. How much would you like to spend? And then you say, Meh, maybe 200 bucks. And then if it's a clever sales rep, he will say, 200 bucks, that's great, but look, we have this awesome suitcase right here. It has all these great features. It, you know, it has wheels and will give you lifetime warranty. And all of this for only 500 bucks. And with this 500 bucks, he essentially anchors your perception of what a suitcase price should be. And then you say, ah, no, nah, that's a little bit expensive. That's not how much I want to spend. And then he says, whoa, look, but we have a cheaper, I'm not doing one with this, not going to be friends with this thing here. Anyway, so we have a cheaper alternative that doesn't have as many awesome features as the 500 bucks one, but it's only 280 bucks. And all of a sudden, you have the perception of having a good value suitcase that is essentially 80 bucks more expensive than you initially wanted to spend just because you raised the anchor and therefore set your expectation of what is a good deal for a suitcase. Now, that's all great. That's just theory. So how does this actually apply to virtual items? Here's an example for a gun. We sell that gun in uh, one of our first-person shooter games. It's priced at $19.99. And you could argue $19.99 is actually a pretty outrageous price for a virtual item that doesn't exist and just helps you shoot people. But let's say we communicated this item is actually priced at $99.99 and now you have a special offer to buy it at $19.99 and all of a sudden it's great you're you're saving 80 percent it's a fantastic offer right and all of a sudden this thing becomes a lot more interesting um, to show you case in point we actually did an a b test um, you probably can't see the banners really well but suffice to say we actually designed a package that contained a couple of items that we wanted to sell in our card trading game, Immortalis, and they were priced at $19.99. So you get a box full of interesting stuff that is relevant for players. And uh, we had one group where we sold that box at the sticker price of $19.99. And then we had a different box where we actually, our B group, were first seeing a banner that actually advertised that same box, same content, same everything for an original price of 4,000 gold coins instead of 1999. Uh, at that price, we actually didn't sell very much, but that didn't matter because a couple of hours later, we actually introduced that same box to the B group for 1999. Now, obviously, as you can see, you're saving 50%. It's an awesome deal. And guess what? Um, the two groups actually had very different results in terms of sales, although the product itself, the box itself, and the price itself were exactly the same. Um, but in all of our language versions, and, and this, is, this is interesting as well, um, we did sell a lot more of the box that was communicated as a slashed price uh, than we did in the other one. So discounts work. But here's a different example of how offer composition and decoys can work. So this is a different strategy. Let's say you wanted to buy a wrench. Um, one wrench is the cheap wrench, the red one on top, right? That's $9.99. Uh, it looks a bit cheap. And then you have this awesome gold-plated version that you could buy. It's $19.99. But that's actually a very difficult decision to make because how do you know exactly if the gold plating is going to be relevant for you? Maybe you just want to unscrew something. How do you make that decision? It's actually a really hard decision to make. But it gets easier if I add a third item to the mix. So now I give you this medium wrench. It's a little better than the cheap one. And it's priced at also $19.99. And now all of a sudden, this is a decision that every idiot can make. Because it's easy. I can take the medium one for $19.99, or I can take the high one for $19.99. And essentially, they're the same price, so I can buy the gold-plated version. It's an easy decision to make. I get a much better wrench for the same price. Fantastic, I feel good about it. So I'll buy the high version. 
right? So by adding another item to the mix that nobody in their right mind is going to buy, you made a decision easier for people to go for the more expensive option. So this is wrenches. Let's see how this could apply to free to play. So again, hard to read, but essentially if you have options where you can buy gems uh, for in-app purchases or things, things like that, or where you have packages of, uh, I don't know, booster items or things like that, that you buy for a premium currency, you could easily design a package or different options where you have a clearly dominant option inside of the mix. So essentially here, you would have one package at the very bottom that has the best value for $20, or 20 euros in this case, and you have another package which is clearly worse because you get a lot less um, points, also for $20, and again, the decision to be made is very easy. You will go for the clearly dominant last option, which is a much better deal. You get something for free, and that actually causes people to select that option a lot more often, because otherwise they would have maybe thought, man, maybe two euros is good, or five euros is good, or 10 euros is good, but now you give them a very compelling reason to buy the most expensive pack. Another example. Caps in New York have actually collected tips for years and years and years, and the average tipping rate uh, for a New York taxi has been around 10%. That's when people paid in cash. Um, then they introduced a system where you actually swipe your credit card and you get a screen that looks a little like this. And I don't know if you can read it, but in the top left corner it says 30% tip, 25% tip, or 20% tip. You can select an easy option, or you can type in your tip value by yourself. And interestingly enough, just because the options are there, although all of them are outrageous because the average tip was 10%, and all of them are crazy high, 20, 25, 30, and still, because it's so easy, and because you gave people options that are even more outrageous, a lot more people are actually gonna tip the 20%. And this is exactly what happened, so the average tip after they introduced this system is now 22%. Fantastic. It's good for taxi drivers, before Uber came along anyway. So how do you apply that for Immortalis? We did the same thing. Essentially, we created three packages. One of them was priced uh, at 24.99 and another one at 49.99 that's the one we wanted to sell more of but um, how do you make a decision between an expensive pack that costs 50 bucks and a not so expensive pack that costs 25 bucks easy you just add another pack that's outrageously expensive it has almost the same contents as the medium pack but it's twice the price so nobody would buy it in their right mind and we didn't sell a lot of it but you just made the option in the middle, the 49.99, a lot more compelling because now it's clearly the dominant pack to buy. Awesome, you just doubled your revenue. Last example, um, anyone who has probably booked a, an airline ticket or a hotel room uh, recently on a portal will probably have seen a screen that's a little bit similar. Um, you definitely save on the rate because all of these websites give you great prices, but they also give you a notion of scarcity, something that you need to act on like right now because otherwise that room is gone, right? So two rooms left, or some will even add things like uh, seven other people are currently looking at the room and the hotel that you're looking at and uh, the last room they sold was five minutes ago or something like that. So you will, you, they, they give you pressure to, to make a fast decision. And all of this, I believe, is mostly bogus because I, I don't think all of these, uh, these pressure points are actually real. But because you believe that hotel rooms are limited and airline seats are limited, you actually think, okay, well, there must be something to it, so I better act now and, and buy my room now because now I, I'm getting an awesome price and if I don't hurry up, somebody else is gonna snatch it away. So, how does this apply to virtual items? I can make a million swords and they're all virtual and, and there's no limitations, right? But that doesn't mean you can't artificially create scarcity and apply the same concepts when you sell. So essentially what you have to do is just put a, an artificial limit to the number of items that people can buy and uh, announce a sale. So let's say this sword is now on sale and uh, give people a good deal so that they feel good about uh, making you know, uh, a bargain. So instead of 99.99, you sell it for 10 bucks, fantastic deal, uh, but you can only buy one per person and there's only a total of, of 30 pieces that are available in total that can be bought across the server or across the entire game or community or whatever that is that is the right kind of setup in your in your environment and you give it a specific time and then all of a sudden you have a limited time sale that is artificially scarce and where people are going to rally to buy and participate in that great deal 
and you give people another reason to buy and purchase your sword. And the great thing is, if you do this in premium currency, um, that you first have to load up in some form or another through in-app purchases or through your, your um, PC-based payment system, um, people actually need to load up before they can participate in the sale, so you'll have virtual uh, currency sales even before you have actual item sales. So that's another interesting effect here. Uh, we did this successfully. I, I don't expect you to read any of this. Um, we did this very successfully in Immortalis. We actually created a, a day and a half of just fun promotions where every hour there would be a new crazy offer that would go online um, with a very limited stock, so only five or 10 or 50 uh, of a particular item, all heavily discounted. And we actually had people staying up all night and organizing in their guilds to make sure that there was someone from that guild online to participate in the offer and snatch it away. And this was probably the most successful sales day we ever had. So the ARPU numbers that you see there are actually daily ARPU. So it's total revenues on that day divided by total number of active users. Um, and it was a pretty aggressive sale in that front. And the fun thing is we made a lot of money in the process. The, the, economy, uh, the economy of the game was not uh, impacted by this because all of the items were limited, so no damage to the overall economy. And people were super happy because they got great bargains. And because they had already charged up their accounts, they also bought lots of other stuff that wasn't discounted, so everyone kind of wins. All right. Now, here's another example. Um, you kind of get the idea. So this is uh, from, a, from one of our PC shooter games. Um, we do a lot of price anchoring. So essentially, you say before it was 150,000. Now it's only 15,000, so great deal, 90% discount. Um, you also say it's totally scarce artificially so, because only the first few people that buy the items are going to get the pack. And in the actual shop, we had three packs available. They all have the same contents, and one of them is discounted at 90%, one at 75%, the other one at 50%. Um, and that creates a situation where everyone is rushing to buy the 90% discount one, obviously. But when you don't get it, and you have just charged your account, what do you do with that currency, you just buy the next best discounted one, and then the next best discounted one, and at some point, all of them sold out. And then people started selling, uh, started buying other things. So essentially, it's the same kind of setup, and it led to a fantastic sales peak uh, for us in, in last December. All right, so I think my time's almost up. Two minutes, awesome. So what you should remember from this session today is that price for virtual items is not determined by anything but perception. And you can influence that perception by giving reference prices and anchor prices that anchor the value of a particular item high. And that helps you create uh, specific opportunities for people to buy when you discount or when you give them a better deal and people feel good about getting good deals. And uh, you should also remember that you can ease decision making for people when they buy. So if you have a very complicated item shop, you can sometimes make people's decision making a lot easier by giving them options that are clearly stupid uh, so that some other option looks clearly superior and then you can guide people's behavior and purchasing decisions towards that pack or that item that you want to sell. And um, ideally you do this in a way that you don't present too many choices because if people have to process a lot of information and you have 10 different choices then that's usually something that, that is difficult, so you give them three or four or five maximum, um, and depending on how you order them, you can actually guide people towards a specific product that you want to, them to purchase. And last not least, I talked about artificial scarcity, so that's another specific trick that um, many retailers use. They make a specific offer for, I don't know, a crazy discounted TV or laptop or phone that you can buy while stocks last, right? So essentially the first 10 people that go to the store will get the awesome discount and the rest is in the store and buy something else. And you can do the same thing with virtual items in your store. All right. Thank you. I hope that wasn't so unethical. Yes, now it's working. Okay, we can start Q&A. So, Oscar Clark, <laughs> first. No, wait, please wait for the mic. 
wait, 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 wait for the milk. And so, um, I just wanted to make a comment because um, uh, this is all great stuff and good psychology of purchase stuff. Um, it's worth being aware, though, in the EU and in particular in the UK, a lot of the scarce, artificial scarcity deals are now being questioned by uh, Office of, uh, it's not Office of Fair Training anymore, but the, um, the Competition Markets Authority. And also the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK are now questioning some of these deals. And we understand that there are three companies currently under investigation for mis-selling practices in free-to-play games. Now, I don't have any, haven't heard any details of that, whether there'll be any actual um, liti uh, litigation off that at all, but I think it's worth being aware that although these techniques are brilliant and well worth understanding, we should temper it with understanding its impact on our relationship with our players. Yes, yes, of course. Um, but that's, that's one of the things actually that, that uh, we took away from, from this um, experience. We've repeated um, these kinds of sales uh, in a number of our games. And every time actually the feedback from the players and the community was fantastic. Right? Because essentially they get an awesome deal. We don't force them to buy anything. Right? We don't. We don't. Uh, as long as it's yeah. an awesome deal. Yes, exactly. Right? Um, because they, they, they do get great discounts in the process. And uh, again, our experience so far from the player perception has been entirely positive. If there are regulatory um, changes, obviously, then um, I, I don't want to promote uh, breaking the law or the rules. So, of course. But come on, we have Japan, we have Bad Getcha, and still. Still, still the crazy sales are going on and on and on. Okay, next question. Uh, here and here. Okay, so the first. And yes. please don't forget to introduce yourself, okay? Oh. Hi, uh, game designer at PokerStars. I, I wanted to share an anecdote and ask your opinion about it. Uh, I was on Hotels.com and uh, I was looking for, for an occasion. I was looking for a top of the range hotel. Uh, and so uh, what I was browsing and not sure about my purchase decision yet, it had, it had all the tricks that you described, the hotel, uh, the hotel I had selected, so uh, discounted price, only a few rooms left, and I was still pondering my decision, and then a small window popped up at the bottom of the screen saying someone from Saudi Arabia, Arabia is looking at this room at this moment. So it, it, it did affect my perception in two ways. First was, wow, someone, uh, this looks like a place where rich people go. And, and second, second opinion was, uh, well, pro this guy probably doesn't care about money, so he's going to grab one of the rooms, and I'm, not, I'm going to lose the opportunity. And that, it did trigger my purchase. And then I thought, wait, maybe I was tricked. Maybe there was nobody from Saudi Arabia looking at the room. So what, what do you think about that kind of trick? Is that ethical? Is it being done? And is there a way to put it in free-to-play games, or is it wrong? <laughs> yeah, well... I don't think tricking people with false information is uh, is a good way to treat your customers, right? So for th for these kind of websites, I don't know if if the facts if these kind of messages are based on facts or whether that's just an algorithm that creates it when you've been looking at an offer for too long. I don't know. Um, my assumption is that there's some tempering, and it's not all real. Um, for free-to-play games, the, the way we've tried to design these artificial scarcity sales was not to trick people into like wrong or, 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 or you know, um, false facts. So essentially, we just communicated the offer very clearly to people, and then they did what they did. So you, put, you, you, you communicate the limit um, of items, you communicate the price, you communicate the time, and then people do um, with that information what they please. Like, we don't manipulate them while they're purchasing, right? That's that goes a step too far for my taste. Okay, next question. Um, okay, I'm Danie Danielle Rafael. Um, you answered part of my question in the last one, but the other one, um, is the price that you giving, like the discount, is it uh, a real discount? Like after it, uh, if like the player buying a gun for $20 a set of the 100, and then he can sell it in 100 or more, or? Is it the twenty dollar is the maximum mark to the product? Um, th that depends. Um, if in in games like MMORPGs where you have an in-game economy where people trade items, um, then you, there's a lot more factors that you have to take into account when de designing these kinds of offers. Um, it's a little easier from a publisher perspective if there is no in-game trading of items. So you essentially, just sell to one customer, and then he he needs to be happy with that purchase but it doesn't have to have kind of a resale value. Um, but in some of our uh, MMORPGs, 
that actually exists. You have to kind of consider the aftermarket and how it affects auction house prices and things like that. And then you have to be a little more careful about what kind of items you put there and how aggressive you discount them because it affects the economy, right? You don't want to burn the game economy with these kinds of techniques. Okay, we have a question there and then last one will be here. And after that, you can ask Stefan yourself. I'll be around outside here. <laughs> Hello, check. Okay. Yotam, I'm a gaming de game designer at Slotomania for Playtica. Uh, you brought up an example of one of your techniques is giving users a one-time purchase, like a purchase that they can only make once. Can you give me an example for like how you implemented it in your product? Um, well, th this one specifically, for instance, uh, for um, we operate a couple of MMORPGs, um, and in those MMORPGs, our, our web mall essentially has a function where you can limit the sales amount to once per account, or five per account, or 10 per account. Um, and that's essentially how we did that. So you could just buy exactly one. And then it's obviously up to you. You could, you could limit, you can lift that restriction um, every time you want, but that, that, then it comes back to building a trusting relationship with your players and your community. So if you, if you trick them and say you can only buy one, and then a week later you put the item on sale for like an even cheaper price and everyone can buy it, um, then obviously you don't you don't create trust, so that's something that you can't do. But um, technically, it's it's pretty easy. You just limit the amount of items that uh, an account can buy. Uh, okay. Yes. Please wait for the mic then. Okay, so that everyone can hear you. But yes, essentially, yes, you just communicate and say only one per account. And that's it. And uh, our web mall has an option that says how many items you can buy per account, so. Okay, and the last question here. Uh, okay, I will give my mic. Uh, hello, I'm Sean, uh, and the game developer. Uh, when marketing um, for pricing, what uh, flight companies used to do is that uh, they used to use your cache and see how often you were to look at, say, a flight, for example and in turn they increase the actual price of the flight. So of course this is now a legal practice and they no longer do this. Uh, I was uh, wanting to query on that, but I was thinking about switching it around. So you use an analytical approach to look at uh, prices and uh, to look at how many people are looking at certain items uh, and they may not be certainly buying it. So instead of raising the price, you could actually lower the price to make it more appealing to the player to actually buy that and make them maybe a little bit more yeah. ethical as such. Uh, un unfortunately, our, our technology doesn't allow that yet. <laughs> um, yeah, I think essentially if you think about it, if, if it's just items that are not tradable and can only be used for one particular player's experience, and let's, let's take an easy case where you don't have a competitive economy where people raid other people or guilds or something like that, if it's just an easy game, the ideal pricing system would actually be completely dependent on your own behavior. So you would start with a particular purchase price and you would go down sort of the price demand curve. And at some point, if some person has not reacted to all these offers, they would get even cheaper offers, cheaper offers, cheaper offers until they actually buy the item. Because the production cost is zero and even if you sell a particular item for five cents, you would still make five cents more than you would otherwise. So um, in that scenario, ideally you would have an algorithm that would determine sort of the, the individual purchasing, um, what's it called? Yeah, what, what you would be willing to pay for a particular item and try to determine that individually for every single player um, to maximize revenue generation from a particular game. But it's not quite that easy and then people talk and then uh, in most of the games that we operate you actually have competition of some sort and that would be completely unfair and spoil the game if you sold sort of uh, a particularly strong weapon to one faction for a cheap price and to another faction for a super high price, that, that's not fair, right? So there are limitations to what you can do. but in a single player type game, um, that's ideally how you would do it. Okay, thanks a lot to everyone. Thanks a lot, Stefan.